I'm making progress with rediscovering radio. My QCX Mini arrived and I've made it. I've made a small dummy load and I've bought an SWR meter and some adapters so I can test my QRP setup along with my Unantenna Plus and any other antenna. I've also fixed up my new Morse key properly with a jack plug and I've made myself a 12 volt battery pack. I still need to put up my full antenna, restore my HF communications receiver and get the QRP Pixie working just the way I want it to. In this video, I'm going to look at my progress so far and I'll offer a few tips about setting up the QCX Mini from my recent experience. The QCX Mini arrived and it went together more quickly than I expected. This is a brilliant kit. It's a very clever design on three PCBs and the online instructions are excellent. I was going to print the PDF of the instructions until I realised it was 121 pages of A4. Instead, I printed the first few pages with a list of parts on it so I could check them off. I followed the instructions on a tablet instead. Once I'd done that, I repackaged the parts into separate labelled bags so it would be easy to find them during the build. The next step I took was to create a list on a spreadsheet of all the construction steps, the components needed for each one, and a checkbox to show which steps were complete. The instructions have a lot of text and pictures for each step, so having a summary checklist was really helpful. If you're planning to make one, there's a lot of material and videos online about this, which there's no need for me to repeat. But here are a few thoughts on the process, which I hope you'll find helpful. The first thing is to keep all the cutoff wires from components. These are important to some later stages of construction. For all the boards, it's important to read through the instructions first and to make sure you know what's coming up. This is especially important with the smaller boards on which some components are soldered in unexpected ways. I built the transceiver in one day. A session for the main PCB and a second session for assembling the two smaller boards, putting them all together and getting started. The receiver alignment and transmitter power test followed a bit later. To populate the PCBs, I went very steadily and carefully. I cleaned the board with alcohol wipes, secured each component in place with tack, and then used sticky flux. Pushed out of a syringe, it surrounds the wire and ensures a good solder joint. Again, I checked every joint visually and electrically as I progressed, taking no chances. Even after this though, I was caught out by one issue, which I'll come back to in a moment. For larger components, such as the power connector and BNC socket, I used a much bigger soldering tip. It's essential to have enough thermal mass to melt large quantities of solder quickly and to complete the joint. Too low a temperature and or too small a tip will mean a long time spent heating things up with the potential for damage. The boards fit together to make one neat transceiver ready for testing. The careful approach paid off when my completed project worked first time and I saw the opening message on the LCD screen. Having powered up, there is some initial receiver adjustment needed using the trimmer capacitor and three onboard potentiometers. This is well covered in the instructions and by other very helpful videos. It went very smoothly for me though and the receiver works really well. I used the receiver for a while and then tried the RF power test and this is where I hit a problem. Almost no power output. I used an oscilloscope to measure the output voltage and I also tried the internal power measuring facility which displays on the LCD screen. I know these measurements are unlikely to be accurate so it's just a question at this stage of testing for a reasonable amount of power as compared to almost none in the first instance. I soon realised that this is a common problem, especially with the 20 meter version, and that some tuning up of the coils in the low pass filter is needed. But whatever I tried did not seem to work. No matter how many turns I removed, or how I adjusted the wires on the toroids, I could not get any meaningful or consistent results. So I concluded that the problem must lie elsewhere. Hans Summers has been keen to stress the high quality of components sourced for recent kits after earlier issues. So what could it be? After reading and watching everything I could about troubleshooting these kits, I found this post from Hans about solder joints, flagging up potential filter problems from ground connections. So I went back to my board 
and amazingly, despite all the care I'd taken, I found that one of the filter capacitor grounds didn't have a good enough solder joint. His point about the ground plane taking up the heat is a good one, and it's a lesson learnt for me. I resoldered the joint with more flux and more heat, and then a retest showed immediately that power was coming through. Having established that the filter circuit was now functional, I then needed to undo the earlier modifications I'd made, like removing turns and so on. When I read the instructions at the beginning of the build and saw that inductance figures are given for the coils, followed by advice that these are not critical, I was a bit puzzled, until I did the RF power test and realised that adjustment is recommended by moving the turns on the toroid. If you have to remove turns though, that means that the headroom for adjustment is just not there. So when I started again with all three coils, I remade and measured them so they could be moved slightly up or down in inductance, avoiding the need for any more surgery. I did this by using a meter, keeping clear to avoid stray inductance and winding the number of turns so that they were around the recommended values when in a middle position from which they could be squeezed together for more inductance or pushed apart for less. I then fitted them back to the board and followed the guidance starting with L3 and working around all the coils until I had the best result. Again, noting that this is not necessarily accurate, I now seem to have around 5 watts, which is very satisfying. So, if you're making one of these kits, my tips are to keep in mind that when you make the coils, they will need adjusting, and that if you have a problem with RF power, check all the filter circuit connections, including the capacitors, before you change anything. I'm very happy using my QCX Mini as a 20 meter receiver, so now I'm going to do a test of my whole QRP setup altogether. I bought a pair of cheap low impedance headphones for my QRP projects. I've added a stereo jack to my Morse key, with one side connected to the ground sleeve and the other connected to the centre pin, which is the jack tip. And the QCX is set up for using a straight key. I strung my wire antenna across the garden, plugged the Unantenna Plus into the output of the QCX Mini and attached that to the battery box and Morse key. This kit is for the 20 meter band, so it defaults to 14020 MHz. The Unantenna Plus has a tuning mode switch, so I'll flick that across and tune it until the LED dims. Tuning around in receive mode, it's clear that this kit works really well, and there are plenty of CW stations coming in with a very simple setup. I'm still practicing my Morse listening. I was very skilled at this when I was a teenager, but after 40 years of absolutely no engagement with radio, I'm more than a bit rusty. This QCX kit has a decoder, but I'm trying not to use it so that I have to rely on my own understanding. It's very similar to learning a musical instrument. You just have to keep doing it. I'm a bit wary so far about making any contacts, but once I've completed a few more steps in my QRP setup, I'm going to give it a try. My journey back to rediscovering radio is moving on. Now the weather is improving and I have a new, very safe ladder, I'll be putting up a decent antenna soon. I'll also be working on my HF receiver and the QRP Pixie setup, as well as the 40 meter QCX Plus kit. I'll be back with more videos about all of this soon and I hope you'll keep joining me. Thanks for watching and I'm now going to see if I can understand a bit more Morse code.